Uh, welcome everyone to another episode of Hashtag Real Talk with me, your host, Aaron Bregg, uh, to guide you through the fogginess that is information security. Today's topic is security posture management as a service, or like Dave and I were just joking about a few minutes ago, a kind of like SaaS within a SaaS. So there's a lot of confusion out there about, you know, configuration. Um, I was just talking to Lynn a little bit about, you know, the FUD, what's FUD, what's not FUD. We're going to do a deeper dive, but in the meantime, I need to introduce my guest, uh, Dave Golding, who is here from App Omni. And now I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to kick it over to you, Dave. How did you get into this crazy world of information security? Uh, yeah, thanks, Aaron. Really appreciate you having me here today and, and uh, highlighting this topic, which since April when I joined App Omni has become even more uh, close to my heart. But uh, started uh, in IT in 1997 during the, the internet boom um, and uh, have continued on. And about 2008 is when I got into information security. Uh, joined a company called Solutionary, which was uh, an MSSP um, that was acquired by NTT. So I spent it's about a seven-year ride um, before we got acquired, and then post-acquisition, you know, ended up being there until just last year. So uh, I've seen a lot. I've worked with a lot of different clients, uh, whether it be. Um, you know, in the that MSSP kind of SOC monitoring space, but also the MS, MSP. I did, uh, Lynn. I do got a. There is one, only one rule with hashtag Real Talk. If you do an acronym, you have to say what the acronym is, and then <laughs> after that, you can use it. So, uh, for the listeners, what is the MSSP? Yeah, good. I'm glad you called me on that because it, it's one of my pet peeves is it, when when people use acronyms without explaining them. So, managed security services provider. So, um, you know, think of back in, you know, uh, SecureWorks is probably the biggest household name, uh, you know, that continues to uh, thrive within that industry. But there's a lot of uh, MSSPs out there doing great work, helping organizations to monitor uh, their environment, you know, essentially providing that SOC as a service capability. Excellent. So you were with, with, a sim, with doing that. And then how did you get over to where you're at right now? Yeah, you know, um, having been in that space for so long, one of the things that I noticed, uh, as I'm sure a lot of people have noticed, is just the, with cloud adoption, um, you know, both private and now with public cloud adoption being so prevalent, um, it just felt like the place that I wanted to go next. Uh, when I looked at, you know, back in 2008, when I when I started in this industry, um, organizations were uh, challenged by trying to get their arms around knowing what was going on, when it was going on, you know, mm -hmm. kind of that 24 by mm -hmm. seven cycle. Um, and I really enjoyed being a part of solving that problem. And I think this is the exact same thing in the sense that um, securing SaaS applications is so difficult right now because there's really, you know, we, we need the kind of innovation um, and automation that, uh, you know, companies like App Omni and others bring to the table to really help security organizations get their arms around this. So, um, and it just worked out, you know, in my life, uh, I've been really fortunate. Uh, a friend of mine worked here. Uh, I talked to him about, you know, wanting to make a move more so just because he knows so many people. Uh, I wasn't really even necessarily thinking about App Omni. I didn't know a whole lot about them, to be honest. And um, that led to a conversation about what we were doing here. And um, I came on board and I've been just loving it. Excellent. All right. We have a lot to cover. So I'm going to jump in with the first area that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, you look at the news, right? And you see this yes, three bucket misconfigured and you see all these different things that are happening and, you know, the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, a doubt around it. And this leads to that, right? A lot of times, and, you know, I'm just as guilty sometimes is, you know, we, we talk about it because we want awareness, right? Like FUD is usually a thing because we want to fix something in security, right? Like our jobs is to help companies, especially small and medium businesses, be more secure. So while I try and battle FUD sometimes, I can be just as big as a culprit. And a lot of times we don't talk in details about what we need to do to fix that, right? So right. it's generally your security analyst is going to be like, okay, this is an issue, let's address it. But a lot of times we don't talk about, well, 
how do you address it, right? So before we talk about the, the how, what, what's the biggest problem you're seeing with default configuration with, with your customers? Is it, is it misunderstanding or not having the resources? Like what's the biggest thing that you're seeing right now? Yeah, great question. Um, and, and I think it, it's those things that you mentioned and, and some others. I, I think, uh, you know, we are at a point in time, especially because of the pandemic, it really exacerbated um, an issue that was already happening, which was, um, you know, this migration uh, to the cloud. Um, and, you know, private cloud is one thing. And, you know, I, I think there's been a lot of, um you know, challenges that have been addressed by technology and, and people are kind of overcoming that skills gap. Agreed, agreed. You know, but, but in the public space, um, you know, with these large SaaS applications like Microsoft 365 and Workday and ServiceNow, Salesforce, um, the, the rapid migration to those, especially, you know, once the pandemic happened, really um, made it even more challenging for security organizations to get their arms around this because it, it broke some of that governance that was in place and that probably mm-hmm. would have kind of uh, expanded as the need for those apps expanded. And so because of this emergency type of situation that happened, right, everybody had to go remote very rapidly. Um, I think that it just increased, you know, the challenges of how do you get your arms around all these users in these very dynamic, complex environments. Um, and so, you know, at the core of your question, I think, uh, and this is not a criticism at all of security, you know, practitioners and professionals. It just is a reality that there is a skills gap in, in, a, in a lack of understanding um, of these environments and exactly how to secure them. Because you secure a, you know, a SaaS environment is a very different flavor than a traditional perimeter-based environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. really understanding APIs, how they work, um, understanding OAuth tokens, um, you know, session IDs, all these different elements. Um, and then Aaron, the final piece I think is, is where we come in and companies like us come in, which is providing a tool to help to automate this process right now uh, the only way to really get your arms around this is manually, and it just doesn't scale. And so organizations are really struggling with uh, getting that visibility into these environments. And then because they're so dynamic and they're always changing, being able to know when something has changed that shouldn't have changed or that deviates from policy um, or you know when an actual attack of some type is, is happening. So some of the stuff that you talked about you know, what, what would you say to a company that maybe a medium sized company, right? Like, so let's, let's take this business use case. I'm a medium sized company. Um, I have a CASB, right? So I have some guardrails and I think, okay, Hey, I have my, my CASB, you know, sorry, I almost broke my own rule. Cloud access security broker, CASB. Nice catch. That, yeah. you know what I mean? That can give some sort of guardrails on, you know, the remote users and stuff like that. What's, what is my CASB not doing? And I'm not saying this like in a bad way because, right. you know, every, secu- there's no one security solution that does everything. So right. what is my CASB doing, or excuse me, not doing that say, you know, security posture management can kind of help with? Yeah, so CASBs are a a great tool and, um, you know, I've made a real difference, uh, especially in, you know, private cloud type of situations where you're accessing the information from inside the perimeter, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, more of a traditional type of uh, uh, security approach. What they're not doing is typically um, CASBs don't have any visibility into what's going on within the public cloud. Um, you know, so if you're accessing, good uh, point. Yeah, I mean, if you're accessing something like Salesforce, for example, which is uh, you know something that we deal with uh, very frequently, um, your CASB's not going to see that traffic. Um, and what we find uh, over and over again, actually, in, in over fifty percent, we've done well over 100 different risk assessments for uh, clients. And uh, what we've seen is that in over 50% of those assessments, um, uh, sensitive data has been publicly exposed, right? So essentially unauthenticated access 
uh, just through public regular internet connections, there's, you know, 50% of those companies have data exposed uh, to the public internet. So that's a, a, you know, a great example and a great use case for what we do. Um, so at the end of the day, sorry, I oh, yeah. didn't mean you're up, but I want to, I want to, I want to dive into that a little bit, yep. especially for the listeners to understand where, why, why isn't the CASB getting that kind of visibility? I think, I think holistically it's good for people to kind of visualize like, you know, the CASBs, like the guardrails, right? Like, like the fence, so to speak, yep. where does the CASB lose visibility that's causing some of these issues? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm glad you did ask me to clarify that because I think that's the key. And that's where the misunderstanding comes is sometimes people are, are over, um, you know, giving CASB more credit or responsibility than it can actually handle uh, just by, by the very nature of what it does. So again, um, the reason that the CASB can't see this is because the CASB isn't protecting the SaaS provider, right? When, when, when I'm accessing Salesforce, I'm going from you know, my connection, my remote connection here at home, unless I'm being routed through the CASB to Salesforce, you know, through my traditional uh, company network, mm -hmm. I um, am not being uh, governed by the CASB, right? I'm going directly to Salesforce. I'm being authenticated into Salesforce and the CASB has no visibility into that. In fact, we did a risk assessment for a CASB provider that's in the Gartner Magic Quadrant. So, you know, a very uh, well-known um, organization that has a great tool. Um, but in that risk assessment, uh, you know, they were surprised to see how much information that we could get access to without their CASB ever seeing it, right? So even, even a CASB provider, I mean, some really smart uh, people, you know, still- right. And that's not a, let's, let's clarify. That's not a knock on CASB. The CASB oh. is doing what is an intended but there is that miscon misconception, right, yep. Yep. on what it can truly do, and then you know where where do, where does it stop, right? So again, I just want listeners to understand, CASB is good. <laughs> yes, yes, but it's, it's good not the valuable. end all. It's not the end all be all. So yes, yes. What are um like? So basically, if I'm understanding this, like the you know the, the as the primer is dissolving. Right, which is over, it's overused, but it's still relevant. Yep. Um, you know, for supporting remote work, how, you know, how can this kind of help? Right. Do you have like any examples? I think in the, you know, on the podcast, you know, the, the pre meeting that pre podcast meeting that we have is I think you, you had a great example about theme parks, right? Like theme yeah. parks and wristbands that I think can really relate to the listeners. Like, so can you, can you go into that example? Yeah, that's actually a, a great analogy that uh, one of our founders, uh, Brendan O'Connor, our CEO, um, uses that really helped me kind of grasp this concept early on, which is, um, you know, if I am accessing uh, a SaaS application um, and if I'm going through a CASB, what the CASB does is essentially grants me a wristband, right? Or even if I'm going through a, you know, something like Okta or Ping Identity, I'm getting a session ID, right? Which mm -hmm. grants me, mm -hmm. um, you know, access into that environment. Um, and uh, another thing that happens within SaaS is I am granted an OAuth token. And those OAuth tokens are not revocable, right? So once I get access, once I get that wristband, I can access any of the rides within that SaaS environment. And also within all the other integrations that happen within SaaS, right? So we're all familiar with how easy it is to, uh, you know, create connections between these different SaaS apps. Yep. Do you um, want to log? Everybody gets a prompt, right? Do you want to log in with your <laughs> Gmail? Do you want to log in with Facebook? Do you want to log in with, you know, Lynn's, exactly. Lynn's backwater home network. <laughs> right. And that's OAuth, right? So once I, once I, you know, once I am granted that, that token, I now have access to the theme park. Um, the reality is as security professionals, what we want to do is limit who has access to what ride. Um, and that's really what solutions like ours does, or a solution like ours does, 
is it helps you to, to understand and get visibility into the who, the what, and the why within a SaaS environment, right? Because there's multiple personas. Each of those personas has, you know, different data access rules, mm -hmm. different configuration rules. Um, and so that's really what we do is we break it down to a very granular level that gets beyond just the assignment of that wristband. We then, you know, create wristbands within the wristband, so to speak. So it's almost like, I mean, sticking with the theme park personality and especially my youngest, my youngest has a birthday soon. Um, it's almost like the height thing, right? Like you have to be yes. X height to ride this ride. So yes, you know, you have your wristband to get into the park. Now you have that another, you know, that other level that says, okay, to ride this ride, you have to be this tall. So, you know, <laughs> We're, we're dumbing it down a little bit, but I mean, it's, it's an apt analogy, right? Yes, yes, for sure. And, and, you know, the thing is, it is important to, to simplify this, right? Because these things are very complex. And, and what we see, though, even with the complexity that's involved is in, in these different client environments, a lot, there's a lot of similarities, right? A lot of the same issues are coming up again and again. And that's not because uh, security practitioners you know, um, aren't smart, very well, uh, you know, uh, credentialed, experienced people. The reality is, is that there's just no way to do this manually. It, they're too complex. They're too big. They're too robust. And they change way too often. So what you need is a tool that enables you to track that, to monitor that and control it. Just like you said, Aaron, guardrails. We talk a lot about guardrails, putting these guard, guardrails in place and then making sure when they're breached, because they will be when things change, that the proper people are notified quickly. And not only that, but they're given instructions on how to fix what's been broken. It's, it's funny. This is, the li listeners won't see this, but the, the YouTubers will be able to see this. But this is my shocked face when you said that. Like, you mean a SaaS provider making a change uh, without advance notice to the customers? I've... Oh my gosh, I've never heard that before. I know right. it's one of the things that uh, dri drives um, my board member Lloyd and good friend up the wall is when he gets, you know, Microsoft Office, Office 365 alerts. So both, you know, work related and not work related. He's like, wait a minute, they just did this and it's going to be, it's already turned on by default. So, you know, yes. we, we joke about that, but but that, that is a real thing, right? And, you know, you and I are not big enough or our company's not big enough to be able to like arm wrestle, you know, a Microsoft or a Workday or well, maybe Workday, but not definitely not a Salesforce. Be like, hey, you know, we, you need to give us a heads up on this config, you know, this new configuration change you're doing, or at least have it off by default and, and let us turn it on. So, Yep. You're not, that's not a cheesy sales tactic that you're using. That's, that's, that happens in the real world. Yeah. It's just reality. I mean, the thing that, I mean, SAS, if you think about, it has absolutely changed the way that we do business and it's so powerful. I mean, you think about Microsoft 365, I mean, where we are today um, and, and what Microsoft has done to make um, you know, email and all these other collaboration apps so much more accessible. Um, it, it, you know, and and the the amount of security that comes built in with what they're doing is very powerful, right? Um, all the things that you know organizations used to have to take on themselves from an infrastructure perspective, from a vulnerability perspective, you know, these updates. Those things have really helped to lighten the load of a lot of IT teams and security teams, but it also has taken a lot of control out of their hands. Right. Um, and then right. like you're saying, like what Lloyd, his frustration is very real. And we all, um, you know, just have to live with that. That that comes with the power of SaaS, comes with that trade-off of now we're beholden to these organizations mm -hmm. and we've got to find a way to work within the parameters that they are giving us. And again, that's where I think innovation, automation, and intelligence come in, um, you know, to, to overcome that gap. We'll talk to the intelligence part of that in a little bit. Um, what are some of the biggest surprises that you're seeing in the industry? I mean, you know, exposed APIs are are pretty much pretty consistent, right? Like those are going to be a thing forever. But 
like, is there anything else besides like exposed APIs that you're that like you as, as a surprise for you in this particular industry? Yeah, I think um, exposed APIs, as you said, are are going to be with us, and I'm surprised at how prevalent they are. Certainly. Um, you know, and, and how easy it is to expose an API without knowing it, right? So what seems like a relatively minor configuration change mm -hmm. and with all the different hands that end up in the, um, you know, in the mix, uh, you know, one side doesn't oftentimes understand what another side is doing, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I that, think that's, that's some hashtag real talk right there. Right, right. <laughs> Silos? I don't, I've never... Yeah, the company with silos. I, I don't Especially, know what you're talking about. Yeah, these really large organizations. I mean, 80% of our clients are Fortune 500 organizations, right? And so they have these very large teams that are, um, you know, being put uh, under a lot of pressure to make sure the business continues to run. Uh, but back to your question about surprises, I think, um, you know, one of the ones that has come up for me is the amount of shadow IT. Uh, you know, I'd always heard a lot about shadow IT. Um, but I think my definition of shadow IT was a little bit different than what I've seen since I, I, oh, I've come this is here. a good one. I want to hear what is your yeah. definition? <laughs> well, and I'll compare it to mine of, and the yeah, listeners. It, you know, it, it was always more of like, you know, just kind of this rogue employee with a, you know, a server under his desk, right. Who, who knew what he was doing and, um, you know, was just choosing to, to make life easier for himself or for his team by, you know, uh, kind of going around, uh, you know, circumventing the rules. Mm -hmm. But within SaaS, so much of um, provisioning of these apps happens outside the purview of um, security. Even IT in general. Even IT in general, right? And so yep. um, the amount of, you know, the, the horse leaves the barn and it, it can be a long time before anybody is even aware of what's going on mm -hmm. and how much data is exposed or the type of data that's in that app. So really the governance around this stuff, um, you know, obviously being in this industry for, for a long time, I know how important governance is, but with the shadow IT component, I've been really surprised. Um, and I, I don't know about surprised as much as just, uh, you know, my heart goes out to IT teams and security teams because they're oftentimes being asked to do something and go in after the fact, whereas mm -hmm. if they go in early on and just be part of the conversation, um, you know, a lot of time is wasted that way. And not only that, but then when you think about the potential outcome of a leak uh, or a breach that could have been avoided had, you know, both sides kind of been talking and, and uh, you know, the people that made this decision and again, didn't make it not like the guy putting something under his desk. They're just trying to accomplish right. a business need. They're doing what they believe is right. And they're just not aware of the fact that there's all these unintended consequences. I think, you know, we, we conveniently blame COVID for a lot, for a lot of things going on right now, but, that part is true. What you're saying is true. And what I mean by that is one of the biggest things I've seen, even at the healthcare and insurance company that I work for is necessity. You know, they're being put in situations where they have to move faster. And, you know, not only, you know, security has looked as a blocker, but I, I really think that that this a, a bigger stigma we have to work on is is IT is a blocker in general, right? So now you have the situation to where you need on the insurance side. We'll just we'll we'll talk health insurance for a minute. You know, it's ultra competitive market. You need to be um, you want to be a you know you want to have something that makes you different, right? A differentiator. You know, so you're thinking about all these different things, and sometimes it might be embracing a newer technology or a riskier technology, or even a riskier idea. And the business just needs to move faster and they're, they're not engaging us. Yeah. So I do think that's, that is part of the overall problem is if we can get more wins with the business to get them more comfortable with having those conversations earlier. Cause I know, um, you know, my leadership is, is, has, has been a huge proponent of that for a while is, it doesn't hurt to have security in some of those meetings, even at the ideation phase, right? Like the earlier you involve us, the, the better the chances are. 
especially with something something new in a SaaS world like um you know you guys you guys have a pretty good um connections to like you know github and GitLab, yep. and you know and bitbucket and stuff yep and with the devs you know with devops and the continuous innovation and the continuous delivery pipeline you know why not have some of those conversations earlier so like you said you can help with either you know not only just maybe identifying misconfigurations but having the visibility before those misconfigurations become an issue. So, sorry, yeah, I, well, I went off on a tangent. I need to be yeah, you make a, a really good point. You, that, you make a really good point that I think we definitely want to uh, hit on, which is in the development process. Um, we have seen it, it's one of the areas because oftentimes what we're doing is if, if you're using our product, um, it, it's going to show uh, things that are broken and that need to be fixed, right? So it kind of puts uh, the onus on security to deliver some bad news. On the development side of things, we've actually been able to see, you know, there's real use cases, real world examples that we can show where by, by putting us into that development process and doing the testing before um, you're going live with a new version of the app, uh, we can really shorten that cycle, right? And, and make sure that uh, you know, the, the code and the new uh, components that are being put into production are in line with policy. So we're actually, you know, it enables security to bring something to the table where they're actually helping dev to go faster and, you know, enabling, uh, you know, uh, more efficiency and effectiveness rather than kind of, you know, be, being the guy that's saying, hold on, um, we've got to fix some things before, uh, you know, so we're able to move forward. would you... And this is where, I mean, I've, I've done some homework on your company, but I have obviously have still have a day job, so I wasn't able to dig in too far. So it may sound like a goofy question, but I'm, I'm just trying to lay it out for the listeners. In that pipeline, where would you live, right? So is it something to where your tool could live in, coexist with something like a sneak or other like secure development tools like the static application scanning, would you guys hit the stuff before to look for a misconfiguration? And then logically the next tool that would run would be like a static application school tool or an open source scanning tool. Yeah. Where, where we would, so we're not going to uh, scan code, right? Where we right. come in is okay. really more at the policy level, right? So okay. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the changes in that new um, app, uh, you know, the new version of the app and, and mm -hmm. compare it to policies, right? So configuration policies, data access policies, making sure that nothing, uh, or I shouldn't say, I mean, obviously things are going to change, but so that it's, it's, uh, it conforms to those guardrails that are going to be in place in production, right? So it is another layer. Uh, around secure code, um, kind of beyond that or on top of that is we have these policies in place as an organization, and we want to make sure that what you're developing adheres to those policies before it okay. goes into production. Because oftentimes when we do see this, we got some really good data on updates as well, and how often updates will break things and you know, or at least change configurations that then um, violate you know, a policy. Violate okay. policy exactly. Okay. Now. As we're getting in, believe it or not, we're, we're motoring through. I knew we would. This A topic initially, my listeners would be like, well, this isn't really a sexy topic, I understand, but, but it's an important one that we need to start, we need to start addressing. So as we get to kind of like the middle of the podcast, middle towards the end, what are, what are some best practices, right? Like, what are your, do you have baseline stuff that you work from, or do you have like a set? list of base policies that you could help a company hit hit the ground running so what are you what are your thoughts on that yeah yeah we, we do we absolutely do because and again that's one of the things i love about working here is you know we're really run by security practitioners right our two founders are former security executives at salesforce right so they've lived this day in and day out so they haven't just built a product that you know we hand off to people and say you know go get them, right? Uh, what we do is make sure that out of the box, um, there are default policies that we've created um, mm -hmm. because we're really blazing a new trail here, right? I mean, this is a new category, us and, and everyone that's that's in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right? there's not 15 vendors doing this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's, you know, there, there, we really are lacking kind of, you know, uh, 
I mean, obviously we, we adhere to NIST and the MITRE ATT&CK framework, and we take in, you know, all these different, um, uh, you know, compliance regimes uh, when we consider our policies. But what we've done is we've actually developed policies specific to apps. Um, okay. you know, typically okay. what we do is when we create a new uh, you know, support for uh, an app, we're actually bringing people on the team who were, who have worked for those companies, right? And who really know those apps and have developed them. It's and like a box. Them. No, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's interesting to see. So you have, you try and, have resources i mean you already talked about salesforce but resources that like understands maybe like a box environment exactly to be able to help with some of those policies which is a which is a good thing which is yeah. a good thing yeah and, and there's really two components to it aaron there's there's you know those policies so that out of the box organizations can hit the ground running and very quickly be able to put something in place. And then they can uh, obviously modify those policies according to their own specific needs, right? Which, you know, so, and, and we actually help them with that uh, throughout the, uh, you know, with our customer success team. But then the other thing is we've developed a really cool component called insights. And so what insights does is it helps to prioritize the different gaps that our product identifies. Um, you know, so again, where, where you're you know, violating or um, you know, not adhering to policy. And it prioritizes those based on the apps that you have, the compliance regimes you have, and, and the things that you've told our platform are important to you. But right. not only that, is it gives then remediation instructions. So it doesn't just tell you that something's broken. It also provides you with instructions on how up? to fix it. Yeah, I mean, because... I mean, realistically, there's, there is, you know, if you had to prioritize something, there's a big difference between maybe a configuration change in like service now, or maybe Slack or something, as opposed to like something bigger, like as you, as your active directory, right. Or docu or DocuSign, right. You know, stuff that's going to have a bigger impact. So I do like that. So, yep. so, it is, so you can prioritize that stuff. Okay. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Excellent. All right. Well, as we get towards the end, I always like to talk about things like what, you, like a good thing. We, we've we, we've talked about some very sensitive topics, so to speak, with configuration. Uh, take a couple minutes. What do you What are you most hopeful for? I mean, we're we're going in. It's crazy. We're going into end of October. Um, you know, November and Thanksgiving is right around the corner. What do you what are you most hopeful for? What what are some of the positive trends that you're seeing in your industry right now? Yeah, I'm really glad you said that because I think um, you know it, it was easy for me when I, you know early on um, in this uh, you know security part of my career, um, it was easy to become kind of skeptical or or jaded, you know, relative jaded. <laughs> you know all the problems. It's just just like. Um, you know, so I, I think I kind of became, uh, you know, again, just a bit, a bit of a Debbie Downer at times. Um, and I, I've really changed my perspective there. You know, again, I've been really fortunate to work with some really smart people and, and really to understand that this is, you know, a journey, not a destination, right? We're never going to rock Absolutely. at a hundred percent. You're never going to, you're never going to get to hundred percent secure mark. <laughs> right. Right. But, you know, the thing about working here is it, it is a, it's incredibly hopeful in the sense that we see where we're helping clients every single day. Um, and, and in particular, you know, what I've always said, you know, I, I found my way into sales basically because there wasn't a whole lot else I was qualified to do. <laughs> <laughs> Us talkers. Yes. Right, right. <laughs> we, um, we don't get in the weeds very often, Bo. We yeah. can we can make a rock talk if we want. <laughs> right, right. But you know, the, the thing that it really appealed to me about it, and that I think has you know brought me success in it, is that really at the core, I like helping people. I like helping them to make the right decision for their organization. And if the right decision is what I'm selling, which it uh, always, you know, that's not always the case, which is okay, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Um I can then see where, you know, the reason I stayed with, uh, you know, my last company so long was because we were making such a great impact, right? We were helping organizations to get better. We were meeting them where they were. Um, and I could really that see tangible, yes, that, that tangible, tangible connect a purpose. Right? Yeah, exactly. That, that That's it. And, and 
we're the exact, you know, App Omni is, is the same for me. The only difference is we're, you know, in the earlier innings. Um, and so what I'm most hopeful about is that, especially, you know, in 2022, we're going to see a lot of what I'm doing right now is evangelizing, right? A lot of it is educating and, and kind of creating awareness around this issue and, and helping organizations to understand. Educating, that not scaring. I love it. I love oh, it. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the last thing I ever do, Aaron, is talk about, there's enough FUD out there, right? Um, really, what I want to do is, is, is equip my prospective clients and, and my clients with information. You know, what we're learning and what we're gathering is, you know, provide that to them uh, as much as possible. I mean, if you go to our website, nothing is gated. We had some great podcasts uh, that are, that, you know, a lot of our best and brightest have done. We've created a lot of thought leadership pieces that are all free. Um, and we don't require, you know, to give us any contact information, but I think, which is wonderful, by the way, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I just saw, I just saw a, a, a colleague of mine, very respected, well-loved colleague, Chris Roberts talk about that. Like, just cause I did this doesn't give you the right to now invade my inbox every day of the week. So oh, that is much appreciated. Like for yeah. the listeners that are listening, if nothing else, go to their website, just because they don't make you put it, put in your uh, email address to get information. That's yeah. awesome. Honestly, yeah. and I'll give you a lot yeah. of props for that. Well, exactly. And, you know, that's the thing. I mean, from our leadership on down, uh, you know, we're really, we've got a great culture here and we're led by people who, again, I think, you know, our heart is in the right place. We're out to make our um, peers in the industry better, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we really do want to make a difference. And we know that our, I mean, we're already seeing that, you know, uh, a tool like ours can make a real significant difference. But I think that, you know, the one thing I want to highlight too is, um, you know, Gartner has gotten on board and, you know, Gartner, uh, you know, wow. see, yeah. we'll but do I some love, real talk there just because yeah. somebody's in a Gar magic Gartner or Gartner magic quadrant. Yeah. Doesn't, does it? I don't really care. <laughs> no I know. Offense. And this isn't the magic quadrant, right? Because, you know, as you and I both know, and a lot of people know the magic quadrant, you know, pay to play. Uh, yeah. It's a bit of that. Right. But the hype cycles, I actually think what Gartner does with the hype cycle really um, can be helpful. And then their in their latest, I, you know, I can give you that. I'll give you that one. Okay. You know, I, because yes. if you really think about, you know, how that process works, you know, how technology gets adopted um, and, you know, what its life cycle or hype cycle is, right? Because there is oftentimes a lot of hype around technologies. And, you know, just like you've been asking me, like, what is, what's the real world? What's the real talk elements mm -hmm. here? of, you know, SaaS security. And so they have identified in their latest, you know, cloud security hype cycle, SSPM, SaaS security posture management, as one of the four must have technologies. Um, and, you know, I think they're- If you're up. an S SMB, yes, yeah. I absolutely. If you don't have a big enough, if you're not, if you don't have an established DevSecOps model right now, or an established AppSec model right now, Yep. Yes, I I absolutely concur. Yeah, exactly. You know, organizations need help getting their arms around this, um, and, and even large ones too, Aaron. I mean, again, um, you know, some of our clients, you know, largest car manuf or one of the largest car manufacturers in the world, one of the largest retailers in the world. You know, so large organizations too, even with really uh, large, robust uh, information security teams, recognize that uh, you know having the right tool at their disposal to help manage this true really visibility important. you can never have i don't care what anybody says you can never exactly. have too much visibility <laughs> yeah that's you know, there's really three components to this right it, it's visibility and then it's protection or policies right um and, and having those evolve over time with your SaaS environment and as these apps change and as you integrate and do more and more and customize them that you're building policies and guardrails around them and then the third component is you know uh, traditional monitoring right so when something breaks um, I want my SOC uh, or, you know, whatever tools I'm using uh, to monitor the integrity of my environment to uh, be alerted and then have it go to the right person. And so there's that workflow component too, that's very critical to this. Excellent. Well, I very much appreciate your time today. See, you, you were all worried about some of these, some of these talking points and, and can we make it interesting? I'm like, if you, if you real talk it and, you know, you explain it in ways for, you know, 
the listeners to understand. It, it can go a lot faster. Exactly. Well, Lynn unfortunately had to drop off because this is where I normally on the sponsored episode, not every episode sponsored, but this particular one is sponsored. I do the whole, you have t- in two minutes, tell me why somebody should, should give you a call. Lynn had to drop off. So it's going to be on you. You yeah. have 120 seconds. Why, why should, why should somebody um, give App Omni a call? Yeah, really, because every organization um, needs this to some degree, right? And so what we can do is help an organization very quickly and easily assess to what degree do they need it. Um, So we do that through a proof of concept process that is very light, um, literally just takes about an hour's time to get set up, basically creating an API into the SaaS app that you want us to assess or you want to do a proof of concept on. Mm-hmm. And then you can literally see in your environment with our tool where you have gaps, you know, how it can benefit you. And, you know, so seeing is believing, right? Um, so that's what we find is in almost every one of our customer engagements, it's that proof of concept that is so powerful. Um, and so even if you choose not to go with us, you're essentially getting, you know, a risk assessment for free. Um, Base, I, at the very baseline. minimum of baseline. Exactly. A very yeah, minimum yeah, baseline, baseline, baseline is probably right. a better way of putting it, but you know, um, I think that's what's so important. Um, and I think that's why organizations should, should give us a call is just because this is a new area where, you know, we can help them to learn if nothing else and kind of, you know, help them to get on that journey towards uh, better SaaS security. Excellent. And free, st- free stuff is always good. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. You know, um, and, and again, uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, what we really try to do is, is be very transparent and, um, you know, it's a no, no expectations, just let's have a look and see what we can find. And in most cases, you know, we find some pretty compelling stuff that I'm then sure very you've rapidly probably found some very interesting stuff. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't, talk, for legal reasons, we can't talk about it, but it would be right. interesting to hear your worst case one. Um, Dave, again, uh, I, I appreciate you taking your lunchtime. I know everybody that some of the newer listeners don't realize, but I, I have to use this, my lunchtime to do this. Cause again, I have a day job and a family. So yep. I appreciate you taking your lunchtime to, uh, talk with me today and you have yourself a, a not good. We're going to say a great rest of the year. Yeah. You too, Aaron. Really appreciate you having me on. <laughs>